Three more minutes to go. Streaming live on Facebook, it says. Yep, I think we should be fine. Okay, good. So, yeah. We You look beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I hardly feel so, but thank you. How did you see that? Uh, it's it's a lazy Sunday afternoon. What can you say? If this is how you look at a lazy Sunday afternoon, I, I would like to see you. When no, you no, get... I do clean up. I, I do make an effort to clean up for my car, definitely. But if this was up to me, oh, no. I know, I know. You look great. Thank you, thank you. So I think one minute to go and then uh, we're all set. We have Definitely some not a lazy afternoon because I'm here painting and watching this. <laughs> Hi, who's this? Who's this? Please, please, please go ahead and. Enjoy. Hi, Ruben. Nice to Hi. see you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, doing two things at once: watching y'all and uh, finishing up some Sunday project here. Multitasking. I like that. Mm -hmm. Good. Awesome. Awesome. Right. We'll ask, we'll yeah. ask you questions at the end, okay? What you listen to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be listening. I'm not expecting you to participate too much in the meeting because, uh, right. But uh, yeah, I'm listening. Okay. Well, we're really glad you joined in, Ruben. It's it's really nice to interact live with the audience. That's always something which is which was makes it very much fun. So. Let me check the time once again. Yep, we're ready to go in about a minute. In about a minute, yeah. Usually the Facebook stream is a little delayed, so mm. that's something we need to remember. Mm. The hair. Is, is, is Ruben at your house or? No, no um, <laughs> Ruben is at his house, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's the beauty of uh, digital stuff, you know? You have people yeah. from all over, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> No, 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 no. Oh, no, okay, okay. But I think we have a steady number of people joining in now. So okay. you definitely have an audience, Saida. Good. We've done a good job. <laughs> Let's hope. So I'm just going to give it one more minute and yes. then we can start. Yes. That way. Mm -hmm. I hope we get some interesting questions for the live audience. That would really, really be a lot of fun. Oh, there, I'm sure there will so be. If you guys are listening and you're already here on the stream, please, please, please ask questions. We really look forward to them. And, you know, you can enter your questions in our chat. That would be great. So. All right. I think we should start. Saida, I'm ready. Yeah. Ready. All right. All right. Go, girl. Let me go ahead and officially welcome everybody. So, dear audience, namaskar, hello, bienvenido. Thank you so much for joining today for Micah's latest digital offering. And I dare say, and I don't want to jinx it, but our last digital show of the year, Seriously Mom. So, for those of you who've been following our work since our inception in 2018, you know we are an organization um, which is devoted to promoting and providing a platform to the Indian arts and cultural related matters, not just in South Florida, but even beyond. Um, since 2018, we have tried to put together shows which not only entertain you, but also provide some sort of a meaningful um, idea which you can help, which can help you um, enrich your life and make this um, an occasion not just to enrich yourselves, but go ahead and help your family and friends enjoy life as well. So last year, obviously, was a bit of a challenge for all of us, um, not just as individuals, but as families, as a society. 
the world that we know as it is completely changed for most of us. So um, last year, since everything went online, digital, Mike, I decided to follow suit as well. Um, and so our live format, which used to be pretty much how we used to interact with all of you, was stopped in favor of going completely digital. So last year, we started with um, our first digital show. For those of you who joined in, I don't know if you remember, we started with a topic called Introducing Ayurveda. And then we followed it up with a bunch of musical events, which received a great response from all of you, not just here locally, but we had audience streaming in even as far as India. So thank you so much. I do remember we had a great response for our Sadigama finalist, Rahul Datta, um, who presented a show called Ye Javani Hai Divani. And of course, the highlight of the year for us was the Shami Ghazal with Ghazal Maestro Talat Aziz. Now, these events not only helped us in uh, popularizing some of the beauty of Indian culture, but these events helped us raise funds for struggling artists and musicians in India. And that wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of you, our dear audience. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for tuning in as ever for all our shows. And we hope now that things are getting better and hopefully now that things are opening up, Micah will soon be back with some exciting programs in its live format. Um, I'll definitely talk about that more later and you'll hear from us through our website and social media. But for today, our focus is on what I already said is hopefully our last event of the year, Seriously Mom. Now, I hope I got my eye roll right because Seriously Mom is a show which talks about the parent-child dynamic, a dynamic which is so complex and yet is the basis of almost every family in today's society. Last year placed a lot of stress on all of us. Um, families came together and spent an extensive amount of time together, cooped up indoors, trying to make sense of this new reality. And we realized that a lot of you were very happy, obviously, to spend some time with your family. But obviously, there was this dynamic where all of a sudden, parents and children had so much time to interact with each other. And yet, things weren't rosy all the time. It never is supposed to be a bed of roses. But we had a lot of audience members, our friends and colleagues who would come in and ask questions about what is it about this new generation? How do we communicate with them? And of course, you had the kids too, who would come in and say, what's with parents? Why are they so uncool? I mean, I know the world is weird, but why do they have to be weird? So to address these questions, we were inspired here at MICA to come up with a show which would help us not only really understand the issues, the complexities, the emotions associated with this parent-child dynamic, but we are extremely fortunate that we have today with us an expert, um, our board certified psychoanalyst and psychiatrist, Dr. Saida Kota here, Kota here, who will be going ahead and telling us a little bit about this. Now, Dr. Kota's journey actually starts from a hometown in Mumbai. The sound is not coming through properly, Shweta. Sorry, can you hear me now, Saida? Okay, much better, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, digital format has its challenges. So if there's ever an issue that you can't hear me, let's just go ahead and type something in the chat and we'll see what to do. So I was introducing Dr. Koita. Uh, you've already heard from her just now. So Dr. Koita um, studied her, got her medical degree from the Grant Medical College and then moved to the United States. After a year of the internship, Dr. Goita decided to change tracks to pursue specialization in psychiatry. Things can be very positive and fulfilling, and Dr. Goita's career seems to go ahead and emphasize that. After completing her psychiatric residency at the University of Miami, Dr. Goita pursued a personal specialization in psychoanalytical training at the Washington University of Virginia. Then, Dr. Koita's career has been marked with numerous professional successes, as attested by her honors, awards from the University of Miami Department of Psychiatry, and as a teacher at the Psychoanalytic Center. As a renowned expert in parent-child dynamic communication, she 
He has served on various academic and clinical committees, panels, and given well-received talks at various national and international forums. Her professional interests and expertise are in the areas such as the working of the human mind, childhood development, interpersonal neurobiology, to understand who we are, what we are about, and how we can change for the better. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce and bring forth Dr. Koita here on our show today, that she can give us more information about parent-child communication and how to improve on it. Dr. Koita, very much. Thank you very much and welcome. Dr. Koita, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Is this better? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead, Dr. Koita. Okay. Shweta, thank you for a very, very generous introduction. I am delighted to be here today, and thanks to Micah and the working committee who have been very patient with me in uh, making this happen. I welcome the group. I welcome everybody who has taken the time out of their very busy schedule. Shweta gave a very nice introduction of the stress uh, we are dealing with for couple, two years now and over on the COVID stress. So stress is part of life. The way I've planned my talk, I'll just give an idea. I have condensed very thoughtfully points, uh, uh, a historical perspective and a biological perspective of the development of the human mind by understanding that you, we will be able to think about ourselves, about our children, and then the dynamics of what goes on between two people, especially the one that happens between ourselves and our children, where the dynamics of power is also a component, which is not part of most other emotional relationships. So, so seriously, mom, I didn't even know there was a show. Uh, and uh, when I heard the name, uh, seriously, mom is very evocative. And I thought, you know, being a mom is a very serious job. And uh, all our life, we are challenged from beginning to end, which stresses us, but also enhances us. Because something we love, and we are, determined to make it work, it's going to challenge our own creativity into opening up spaces in our mind and heart to make things work. And this is the beauty of life and love. Uh, the other part about the Seriously Mom, uh, I gathered, I, my thoughts went to, um, I'm going to just, I made up two episodes of two youngsters where there's a 14, 15 year old girl, let's say, who comes to the mom in the midst of the COVID and says, I'm really so bored, mom. My friends are getting together. They're just going to be out of the poolside. Can I go? And her mom gets anxious and they're all her own activation happens and she's anxious and she's afraid and whatnot. And, and there starts a dialogue between mom and uh, daughter and the daughter says, seriously, mom, like, like, you don't get what I'm saying. You don't understand me. I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. While that's a tense moment. Now, I just, I'm going to throw up another example of, let's say there's an older kid. The kid has gone off to college. He is already 21 years old, independent, doing well. School's closed down. They came back home. At home, um, he wants to get together with friends. And he says, I'm, I'm going out and we're going to be with friends and so on. And there starts dad and mom again. What do you mean? You know, you, we, there starts this tension and this dialogue like. And so again, the son says, seriously, mom, I've been on my own all this time. What do you think? So now, obviously there are strong emotions in, in the child or the youngster and there are strong emotions in the parent. And these two, they are bound to collide, how it affects us and how we're gonna negotiate about it. 
I decided that I'm going to go into some understanding of human development and the mind so that we can then come back and see how best we can help our kids and ourselves navigate through this because this is stressful for everybody. Now, the good thing about stress is that stress is part of life. When life started on this planet from one cell millions and zillions of years ago, for its survival, it had to fight. So the survival instinct in every living thing is very powerful. But it, so for, for survival, it has to bond with another cell. But there is an anxiety about the bond. Am I going to be eaten up or can I bond happily and we can recreate and this species could go on. After millions and millions of years, here we are, the homo sapien, the human being, that is this magical thing of all kinds of systems in our body working harmoniously to live together. So, so the point I want to make in this is that both things are important. Um, Uh, unity and tension, ambivalence, conflict, life and death, and all these opposing elements are always operative at all times in every aspect of our mind and body. And this, of course, what goes on in our body, we don't know. But if you are a specialist in a particular area, you know how each cell or each organ is trying to survive and thus it's, it's now come to the, to the level of that this is something part of life. Um, so the human being, we are wired, so everybody, so, so the brain is something that has evolved, but the homo sapien, that brain is more of the emotional brain and that's the highest evolved brain there is in nature. In this highly evolved brain, we are wired for love and bond. From the day a baby is born, um, bonding and love is what starts the wiring of the brain. The, uh, we have some neurologists and neuroscientists in the group and they can correct the numbers I might say but there are, let's say, 40 billion neurons in our brain when the baby is born, which then gets pruned to some 14 billion so that the brain can function properly and harmoniously and all these functions can operate seamlessly without even our knowing it. Mm -hmm. So this pruning of the brain, of the thinking and the feeling, which are constantly in interaction with another. So the feeling starts, then the thinking starts, and these dynamics go back and forth, which lays the map of our feeling, thinking, and analyzing. To, uh, to, huh. So from these now pruning that happens as developmental path in the early years of life to let's say 14 billion neurons develop many other side connections, which we call synaptic connections. These synaptic connections now are 10 trillion in connections. So I want to say, I'm mentioning these things for us to have an empathy, how hard it is to manage our emotions under stress. So the functioning has to happen in nanoseconds. All of these things that is going on and working in us happens automatically on our default mechanism and without our knowing. But when we are emotional, our emotional brain is very powerful and our cognitive brain abilities will go down. So whatever ability we had for thinking, and we all know this, when we are upset, we want to say something and then we start kind of using either foul language or use our authority or, you know, abandon or uh, do all kinds of other emotional things. Our ability goes down. So the importance of understanding this is 
that when the emotional brain is challenged, how can we refine ourselves so that we have better utilization of our ability at those very critical moments when we are challenged, seriously, mom, and arguments and tensions and all this that can ensue in, in parent-child relationships. The thing about parent-child is parents are, have, we have stress of many things, mm -hmm. work, managing this, that, wanting our children to achieve, et cetera, et cetera. Children have many stresses. Their sense of identity, their self-esteem, how, how do, where do I belong, how am I, what am I, who loves me, who doesn't love me, and et cetera, et cetera. So the goal of parent, who is the authority over here, is to help them on this developmental path to the best of their potential, which is not an easy task to do. Because if, let's say there's, there's a family where, where parents are highly stressed and are shortchanged about the ability to sit back and think about things, a negative dynamics will evolve. And this may lead into a certain pattern that is now built into later on in life. Or there could be another situation where, where parents can stop and think what to do and let me how to negotiate this, et cetera, and a different path can be set. Because children is going to be part of our life forever, as long as we're alive. And our goal is for our children to be well, and for us to have good relationships with them and them with us. So, so learning about, so we need an empathy for us as parents. We need to be empathic, how hard it is with the best of intentions and with the best of availability, it is always going to be challenging and not to be disheartened and not to feel upset. But what we need to have is the power of knowing who we are, where we've come from, what is our own roadmap of thinking and feeling, which comes from our own childhood, our own experiences, our fears, insecurities that are not, we have not dealt with, that lie dormant and sometimes, many times unbeknownst to us. But when it comes to the emotional sensitive arena, it raises its head unbeknownst and we respond from those anxieties. For example, uh, a parent may be very anxious about the child really achieving, doing well, and going to the best of the colleges. Because the parent who may have grown up in difficult times and arrived at this country with not much in their pocket, really want their kid to have a good life and a good future. That's the parent's agenda. The child has not grown up in that kind of circumstance and doesn't kind of really understand it. So when you say, look, you better study, you can't go out with your friends or you can't do this, you should first get A's in your, in your class. The kid is going to start feeling different and in conflict with the parent, okay? So these conflicts, I'm going to give you now examples of how we deal with conflicts. But first I want to explain that conflicts are inherent and the child is trying for their own survival. Like I said, survival of every living thing is inherent. The child wants to survive, wants to be his own person, wants to exert an influence and, and differentiate himself for his own identity and self-esteem. There are two major periods in a human being's life where there's maximum growth and it's a maximum time of opportunity for parent-child work to be done. The first period is from zero to six when the child is an infant to six years old where emotions are all what the child is about but the cognitive abilities are slowly developing in the interpersonal relationship. So how we interact with the child, 
let's say, who has a temper tantrum, who makes a mess, or how compulsive we might be, or how stressed we might be from work and we have to make dinner and the child wants to be held and cuddled. And all kinds of these different kinds of things that go on between the parent and child, but that zero to six is a very important time for major prune, brain pruning and models of interpersonal relationship will develop at that time. Another huge important time, and we get a second chance at this, is from the age of 15 to the age of 26. So research shows now that the adolescent brain continues into easily into age 26. So we have a great, uh, wonderful time because adolescents are now more verbal than the five-year-old and uh, it's going to challenge us more because they are verbal and they are uh, uh, self-righteous and you know there still is the younger brain trying to grow and the younger the brain, the more black and white they are. They only think at extremes, you know, yes and no, black and white. And how do we help them get into this gray zone of thinking, which takes, you know, it's how we interact over time that's going to help them grow into their own ability of thinking. If they are emotional, how they can kind of tone down in the way we talk to them ask them questions. So if a kid says, seriously, mom, you can say, uh, you know, I didn't quite get, maybe I don't understand uh, what is it you really want? Can you really tell me? Maybe the child will say that, no, all the friends are getting together. I really miss them and I wanna be with them. Fortunately, let's say a kid might say that, okay? You, then we have to be empathic. So empathy is very important in the relationship. Uh, we have to drop our own fear. And this is very important. We have to know our own fears that, oh my God, he's going to catch the virus and something might happen to him or something may happen to me or my, I have my mom at home. And you know, we have to drop our fears and we have to understand the child's needs and we have to talk to them. So look, I know it's really hard. Empathy, empathy is important. Uh, right now, you've been, it's been very lonely. It's hard to be with friends. Um, how do you think we can help the situation? So always, we step down from the authoritative role. We try and be collaborative. We want to communicate. We want to be empathic and listen. And then we want to negotiate. And not that this is an easy journey, by the way. This is, happens continuously. We may negotiate and find a way and, and, and give them the power. Like, you tell me how we can solve this. You're a smart kid. You know that we have the worry about the virus. Grandma's here, you know, and she's kind of frail. So what do you think might be uh, a way that you could meet, be with a friend, but yet at the same time, you know, so the, how we dialogue, how we understand the kid's feeling, how we negotiate and all of that. It's like the temperature goes down and the internalization and in the memory bank, there'll be these memories because life is about memories of all kinds of interactions. And the more important the relationship, the more imprinted they are on our brain. So these memories of how we talk with our children is what's going to be the roadmap of how they're going to be with us and with their own children and in life. And we are empowering their brain to function at a analytic level, not at an intuitive, reactive and emotional level. Because we all have that. We all have reactive selves and emotional selves and we get irritated and we get upset and we get all of that. But we strive for these learning things of uh, the more we have a handle on our emotions, the more tools we have of negotiating these things with the people we love the most. It, it could be our spouse too. Obviously, it's all uh, our spouse also. So, so the evolution, I, I spoke a little bit about the evolution science of how each being is trying to survive 
there is the part of we need one another, but we also want to be ourselves. And uh, early, the more scared we are, the more uh, we may bond together through unhealthy bonds. So when the when you, when Homo sapiens were out in the jungles fighting against all the crazy animals, we our our main brain was about fight or flight, you know, and we needed our tribe to help us. So our brains are wired to react in nanoseconds against danger. Now we know there's no real danger really in, in a parent-child relationship, but the activation is just as if it is because our primitive brain or a reptilian brain has not yet evolved to that degree. It may take another million years for that to evolve to the level it's capable of. Shweta? Hi, can you hear me? Can people hear me? I can hear you. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Okay, all right, thank you. So, 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 I was talking about the, the primitive brain and the high functioning brain and how under stress, the primitive brain is definitely going to take over because the fight flight response is innate in us through millions of years of evolution. Um, so I think I've said enough for the moment let me see if there's some important points um, about what we can do. So one point I'm going to highlight again to be a little repetitive is that to know ourselves, who we are, where we come from, et cetera, know our own feelings. What is our weakness? You know, I may be insecure about this and this, or I may be worried about this and this. It comes from my own childhood. Uh, and and un, unbeknownst to me, I may be imposing that on the kid and the kid is going to feel like, mom, like this does seem, doesn't make sense, you know? And so we have to, rather than argue with them and press our point, we need to step back and have self-reflection. So self-reflection -re is extremely a very important tool so that self-reflection allows the heat to go down, have more analytic abilities, think about stuff so that we can have a more thoughtful response to, at the moment. So know yourself. And we want to know ourselves in a vertical way from the deepest part of ourselves to the most current one. We have adult experiences, we have adolescent experiences, we have childhood experiences, we tap these memory bank from the memory bank, all these things are just happening fast. We make these connections. And, and this, you know, things come from our toolbox and we can utilize our own experiences, but how we use it and how we communicate it is what's important. So the tone of voice is another very important thing to understand in parent-child relations. When we are frustrated, our tone is going to come across as, oh, you're being critical. You're being judgmental. Uh, you don't like me. You don't like who I am, etc. And we like befuddled, right? That's not my intent. That's not what I'm doing. And yet, you know, uh, because we're frustrated, our tone may give a completely different message. And it's in this space where it's completely misunderstood by the child. So when the kid says, and hopefully our kid may say that, there are many, most kids won't say it. They'll absorb it and it'll go into their memory bank. Mm. Mm. When we realize that we've been too oppressive or too reactive or too strong, we need to go back and revisit ourselves. <coughs> revisit ourselves, go back to the kid and say, listen, I was thinking about what just happened. I think I was, I was, I was too upset. I couldn't think clearly. Let's see if we can talk again. And it's fine to even say, you know, I was, I was responding to your grades because I'm I think I was dealing with my own fear about how your future life might be. And actually I have no idea about that. Who knows 
what worked for me may work for you or not. So I'm really sorry about that, okay? I want you to be your own person. So humbleness, listening to your child, communicating with your child, builds the bonds of communication. It's the bonds of communication that develop healthy relationships for now and for the future. So not only should we look at ourselves, we should also look at our child's feeling and where he is developmentally, you know? And uh, kids have to deal with a lot, just like we, if you go back to our own childhood, you know, we have a tendency to glamorize it. Oh, my childhood was so good. I had so much fun. It was really cool. But because we haven't had the self-reflection- I very much out teacher. Huh? Please move you yourself. But medium dress. No, no, this is loose as hell. What the heck? Sorry about that, Saida. I think we had an audience member with an unmute microphone. Please go oh, ahead. Okay, okay. All right. So anyway, so we have to think about the child's feelings, his anxieties, the world he lives in, him trying to fit in. Okay, so I'm Indian in color, but, you know, I have to deal with someone that's... Uh, white with blue eyes and then there's the afro and there is the chinese and there's the asian and you know there's all kinds of things that the mind will utilize outside to fit a conviction inside so the negative feelings are not coming from the outside they're coming from inside the child and the source of i am indian and i feel bad about that is not because he's Indian and has nothing to do with being Indian, it's coming from some other source. So we can utilize things from the outside and make it into things that are negative. And then we are off on the wrong track totally. So we have to understand where that feeling is actually coming from. What is the self-esteem really about? Most of the time the self-esteem may come because the child has a tendency to feel very guilty about being mad at the parents. It is inherent in child development that the child is angry at the parent because there's always the power issue and the control issue. And every child has a tendency to feel guilty consciously and unconsciously. And that guilt can affect one's self-esteem. Like I'm a bad boy because look, I'm really mad at my mother. And at times I wish she were dead. She's such an idiot. She has so much control over me, blah, 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 you know? And then that guilt stays inside and that guilt can build and it can be expressed through some other avenue that has nothing to do with the issue at all. So that again is another important thing. So communication <clears throat> with that kid in an empathic way, being patient, because life with your child is a journey it's lifelong and there's so much time in different phases of life to talk, to help, to communicate and build better and better bonds. It's never too late. It's never too late to reflect on ourselves, on our kid and how we, what we can do to improve ourselves in, with our communicating abilities. So while I was thinking about all of this and reading all kinds of even neuroscience and whatnot, I, I, in India, and, and this, I think, game is played here also, which is the tug of war, right? Yes. There's a group of guys on one side, there's a group of guys on the other side, and it's the rope in between, and each one is pulling to win. So these are the dynamics of relationships. All relationships have the tug of war. There's tension as, at times of who's right and who's wrong. And there's a pull, and you feel like, oh, I'm not being listened to. Oh, uh, you don't understand me. You don't get me you know, and so on. So if we imagine this tug of war within a, a couple, parent, child, husband, wife, or whatever, it's like a rope. So what can happen is the rope, if pulled too much without it coming back, will start to, the strands will start to break. True. And these little strands that will break, they could be repairable, or you may, it could go too far. If, if a parent has difficulty with being dogmatic, which comes from the parent's own anxiety and insecurity going back to his childhood. So underneath any dogmatic thinking is insecurity and inability to think beyond that dogma. So obviously 
you can't have communication with someone when you are dogmatic because you take the self-righteous position and there's no one that can talk to you. So automatically there's going to be a break. And this break of this string, this rope, this bond between two people is going to start to fray. So none of us really want that. Even the parent who's dogmatic doesn't want that, but he doesn't realize because he's so scared inside. Dogmatic people are very insecure and scared to be any different, but they hurt the most important relationships, which is either with their spouse and the children. So, so if we can help, you know, if we can look into, each of us can have our own dogmas and prejudices. And if you can look into it and think about it and try to expand our mind and try to understand it, this is only gathering more tools to deal with life and relationships. Um, so some suggestions. <clears throat> we need to pay attention to creating positive environment. If there is tension and there's all this kind of bickering, we kind of drop it and see what we can do. Uh, let's play a game. Let's play a board game. Let's play a, uh, one of those funny, there are so many interesting board games where you kind of create and draw pictures and uh, that. Or uh, go out to the pool. Let's cook together. Let's do, let's uh, take a yoga class online with your daughter, you know, et cetera. So creating positive experiences is like money in the bank, okay? So when there is upset feelings, there's positive feelings in there also. And, and that money in the bank is really helpful under stressful times. Um, so I think I've said enough for now. Uh, I am past my time. Uh, let's, let's see what questions there are out there. I can, I can definitely tell you, we could hear you go on more and more because everything that you're saying makes so much sense. It's incredible, especially the examples, the case studies that you've given out. I'm pretty sure last year, every parent who's tuned in today has definitely seen one version of it or the other. So that was very informative, Saida. Thank you so much. And uh, we already have a few audience members who've been commenting through our chats about how important some of the points that you've made are regarding apologizing to your kids, confronting your own prejudices and dogmas, and having an open-minded communication. So I think this would be a good time for me to go ahead and let all our audience members know if you have any questions, please go ahead and either uh, ask them in the chat window that you can see on Zoom, and I'll be more than happy to read them out for you. Or if you really want to ask either the question, let us know and we can have you unmute yourself and ask Dr. Koita um, your questions and queries or any other comment that you might want to make. So Saida, I already have a question here from okay. one of our audience member who wants to be anonymous. Okay. And it's a very interesting question. And that's something that I really would have wanted to ask you myself. Okay. What, according to you, is hmm. the ideal age for a parent to start practicing this art of communication effectively with the kids? When do you really start? Is it this time when you have this emotional growth of the child happening during the first six years of life? Or is it already a lost cause by the time the kid is a teenager? And you know. It's, okay, so very, very good question. It is never a lost cause. You can start when your kid is 30 years old. It doesn't matter. Communication starts from the day the baby is born because messages are given sensually and physically through the skin, how we hold the baby, how we talk, how the cueing goes on, the cooing and the cawing and the this and that. Communication has already started. It also starts in utero. We're, we're talking to the baby, we're rubbing our tummy, we feel like, you know, so communication is from the get go. So that goes on lifelong. There's no such thing as when do we start? It starts from the beginning of when the baby is born or, or in utero, and it goes to the end of life. If you start to realize this when your son is 40 years old, fine, no problem. You just ha have to think about it and work a little harder. They, we, somebody who starts, let's say when the son is already 40, we need more empathy, more understanding of where the kid is, uh, humbleness, 
gentleness and and putting yourself out to say tell me what i can do you know i know i've been a difficult mom uh is there anything uh, i can do at this point we have a long life ahead i've loved you more than life itself but i couldn't help at times who i was i was this way because of abc and xyz but you don't deserve for me to be have spoken to you this way so communication communication can happen at any time perfect fantastic so that's very reassuring so in case some of you feel that you missed the bus no it's never too late that's what dr paita wants you to know so I have, a a side, uh, i have one thing to say so when my children were little <clears throat> and i was obviously very tense i'm a tense hyper person and uh, irritation and frustration oh, and so I don't, i don't believe that oh yeah believe me believe me oh my but if my daughter is online she's going to say uh, affirm that but 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 the thing i always would joke thank god i know there is psychoanalysis <laughs> so, <laughs> if i mess up i said my children are going to the therapist that's all so i would relax and say okay i know i'm going to fuck up a little here and there and i'm going to fuck up it's okay you know so so there's always help there's always help never that's another important point i want to make help is like education of the mind and help is education of our emotions there's nothing more powerful than our mind we pay so much attention to our body and to our heart and to all of this but the most important organ is the mind and the brain and they are totally interconnected and we are scared to go and educate our mind perfect perfect point well made which brings me now that you brought the topic of your own kids that was a question yeah. that you know a lot of us were going through yeah. uh, oh forget about my question i have a question from kanchan here we we'll come back to that my question later because you know it's important we go ahead and talk to our audience first so kanchan sakrani um hmm. has a question that she wants to put forth to you and it goes this way um kanchan hi thank you i'm going to read a question now uh, please feel free to interject if you want to okay how do we get our partner on the same page with us with respect to communication to children under 6 if the perception is that children should obey listen follow directions and with this pandemic everything is falling apart emotionally for them how do we respect their development and need for autonomy oh that's a very loaded question <laughs> that's a very loaded question so in the equation you're throwing into the other the partner the uh, the two parents right you, you talked about the partner right yes a partner who has one way of communicating to the child and the mother has another way of communicating to the child i think both need to go back and look into themselves as to where is my thinking coming from did this thing occur in my own childhood when i was a little boy how did i really feel when my father was took out the belt to hit me when i did something wrong how did i really feel about that okay if the person can touch the, their own pain then we can be more empathic and be more current to the difficulty now with your own child but if you're going to be blocked and if a person is going to have the dogma oh no my child who is so fantastic i hear this all the time by the way oh no no there was no issue and uh the human mind is very scared to look inside you know and i deal with this when patients many times come and they want to spend, send their spouse for treatment because they're very scared to look inside and they mm -hmm. are i mean from this i hope that like i said the number one organ of the human being is our mind and our brain and if we block that then we are robbing ourselves the opportunity to have a more have a ferrari of a machine that can go fast and slow and do all these you know kinds of things so in that instance if i think is to ask the spouse please reflect where your thinking comes from think about it 
get to your pain and now you will be able to have an empathy that what hurts you, you may be automatically responding in the same way without to going through the cognitive process. Because like I said, 80% of our functioning is instinctual from automatic thinking and being. That's my advice. Right. Thank you for that question, uh, Kanchan. Uh, that's definitely uh, spurred a little bit of an interesting discussion here, which I think we can hope to take forward. Um, so obviously we have another comment from Dr. Amruta Parekh in our chat. And she says that though I was done parenting when they entered their 30s, she's talking about the children, but I see through the pandemic, the children have been back with some really interesting discussions, which have led to better choices personally and professionally for both of us as parents and the children. Thank you, Saida. So, you know, you, obviously your talk has definitely resonated with a lot of parents who've spent so much time with the kids last year. Um, and as you had mentioned about your own children, you had brought in your daughter briefly. My question was, is do you really see some sort of a difference in communicating effectively between the sexes? Um, are boys easier to communicate with or girls easier to communicate so with? That's a very, very, very important question. Not only is it my personal experience, but also I hear from my patients. Right. And many books have been written about this of mothers and daughters. Mothers and daughters is such a love-hate, difficult relationship because the daughter who is little wants so much to be like the mother, doesn't realize that she's got a whole journey and she's going to become even better than the mother. She may be caught in this anger, envy, self-loathing, uh, all kinds of things in this dynamics of mother-daughter and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. And I think it's up to the mother really to continue to um, remember that, how hard it is for a daughter, especially when you have a mother that is highly successful and everybody likes her and they think she's fantastic. But the daughter might think, oh, she's a real bitch. You really don't know how she gets, mm -hmm. you know, you guys, et cetera. Which of course the children are going to have such feelings because you know, we have tensions in between with our children. So what was your question again? Uh, How, are, are there any different communication strategies that you would want uh, to employ uh, with boys and girls? So boys, um, boys, because of the dynamics that, that are different in the gender, <laughs> generally there isn't this kind of conflict in, in boys. You know, they see them outside of this kind of thing. You know, I really want to be like my mother. I want her to be really proud of me. And I, will I ever be like her and so on and so forth. And so that's with a successful mother, right? There could be a very depressed mother, a mother who hasn't achieved much. And the child sees the father and really wants to succeed and may have some conflict about that and feels a great amount of pain for the mother who is kind of somewhat depressive, her self-esteem is bad. She was raised with some negative input in her own growing up. And the mother has struggled with her own self-esteem. Now the girl has to find her own self-esteem. It may come from the father. It may be a different kind of self-esteem. And there's conflict about that of becoming more successful than the mother and so on and so forth. So there's a whole array of different things that can happen between mother and daughter from one extreme to the other. So, you know, in all these instances, Help is important. Get counseling, try to find out, get your child the help, get yourself help. This is all education. We, we, in this group that we have, everyone believes in higher education, you know, and this is a form of education. This is an education. There's no shame in this. There's no shame because we, you know, our culture tells us, oh, you know, if you have problems, it's really shameful. We we'll shove everything under the rug. But, but we live in a different world now. We live in a world of openness, empowerment, communication. I mean, this is what offer, has offered us, you know, in the, in, the, in the modern world. I think that's a very important that you made here, Saida. Yeah. Talk, seek help. Don't just, you know, wallow in self-pity. Ask yeah. for help, get it fixed. That's the important message here. So I hope a lot of us who are attending this talk take it. And, and one more thing about that, 
There's no shame in it. In fact, you have to be right. proud. It's like right. you're going for a special education that will improve the most important relationships of your life, you know, Absolutely. your partner and, and your children. What's more important than that? Absolutely. Yeah. We've been talking a lot from the perspective of parents so far. And yeah. I, as a former kid, you know, yeah. um, who I think I'm still pretty much in, in that sense, internalized it. Um, my question here is from the kid's point of view. Yeah. Sometimes kids come up um, and tell you that it's so hard to talk to our parents. How do we get to just trust? How do we make them trust us? How do you go about and communicate with them without unleashing this whole preachy thing going yeah, on? Yeah. You know, so you I, I forgot one very important point that you're reminding me of. What does a child need in the, in the parent-child relationship to flourish? What can improve the communication, right? Definitely, we know that we love our children, okay? <clears throat> so love, but being able to listen to them. Understand their where they're coming from without judgment, right? The ability to listen to the other without judgment is a very difficult task, I can tell everyone in the audience. We say we try and achieve that, but our inner biases are unconscious. Our programming is like a computer that's already developed and now you're putting in new information. It's going to build on the old information. So, our prejudices, our biases, our fears, our insecurities are going to be in the way. Uh, what was the question again? <laughs> so how do you, so as a kid, how do you make your parents trust you to communicate? Yeah. Huh. So yeah, that's the important point. So trust in a relationship is extremely important. That the child needs to feel that no matter what I say, I'm not going to be judged. Not easy to do, but this is our goal. So for example, let me think of an exam, make up an example. Uh, the kid, the girl is 17 years old and she has a boyfriend of another ethnic origin. And she has a real crush on this boy and they've met and you know, whatnot and so on. So now how am I going to tell my parents? So if she's afraid that she's going to be called names, Put down, you know, <laughs> call the whore, you cheap thing, you slut, you this, you that, all of that. What, what has happened? The child already knows the parents thinking, how the parents is taught uh, things from the relationship. So the child is afraid. It's not a safe environment for the kid to be able to come and talk about their naivete and their innocence in which they want to. So, <clears throat> Feeling of safety is crucially important in mother-child relationship. The child must feel, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how biased my parent will be, they will try and understand me, not come from their bias. And maybe we can have a dialogue and parent can explain, you know, I think this way and that way. And right. so what do you think? And so negotiation can happen only when the parent has the ability to reflect. So safety in a relationship is extremely important. Now, if the child feels that the parent is going to be harsh and judgmental and I'm going to be called names, she's going to keep secrets. She may enter into bad relationships because she can't talk to anybody. And she may make bad choices. The whole thing may start to go downhill, you know? And, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad. It's very sad for both parent and child. You know, it's not that parent is ill intending, but they don't have the tools to relax and be present for the child past their own dogma. Perfect. Mm. I have another audience question here from Kiran. Okay. Kiran wants to know, mm. how do you deal with differences of opinion with adult children if the decision involves you? Aha. Uh -huh. Can she give, she did make it a little more specific so I can respond specifically? Uh, I no. guess, yeah, I mean, I can, we, we can wait for her to respond, but meanwhile, if you could just give, it's an interesting let me, think, let me think, let me think. So if your adult children have differences yeah. in opinion, that's a yeah. question, right? Yeah. How do you deal with them? Exactly. Deal with How those differences in opinion? With these differences? Especially Look, with we, adult kids, it's difficult because they're so, I mean, they have their own opinions and they have their own, you know, 
wealth I mean, of personality. So well, I, I mean, I can tell you what I would do with my kid. <clears throat> if it's a difference in opinion, that's not really going to be harmful to them. Okay. Uh, and it's a difference in opinion of, I don't know what difference in fact, I can't make up one. Well, if the kid says, uh, I've been smoking pot and I really love smoking pot. And mom says, what the hell, what are you doing? You know, why are you using uh, drugs and things like that? Mom, but this is like, you know, it's soon going to be legal. Everybody's smoking some pot. What's the big deal? Now there's a difference in opinion, okay? Now, obviously the parent feels, and most of us are brought up that way, that smoking pot is like a bad thing to do, you know, or a cheap thing to do, or only bhaiyas do that, you know, from what, what we remember. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, the kid is in the environment where he has a need to belong. And there is a bonding of through maybe smoking some pot, he has friends. So the child is dealing with a self-esteem issue inside, young or old, doesn't matter, because the need for bonding may override his thinking. Now, there's a point here. Maybe pot smoking is not that bad if used appropriately with good judgment and, and just like alcohol, you know? I mean, when my kids were at a certain age, at a younger age, and, and they were drinking, I would say, well, you know, call your friends at the house, we'll serve drinks and they will sleep here. Okay, fine, underage. I'll take the responsibility and the kids would kind of, you know, uh, uh, ha uh, be happy about that. So they know that they can, they're safe. Right. They're not going to go out, drink, drive and end up in a crash. Right. So, that, so that, that's a very interesting way. Just befriend them and just give them a safe space. Yes. Right. Yes. That's yeah, very interesting. Right, right. So we have one question here from Vinita that I'd like to read out. It's from it's okay. on our chat. It mm -hmm. says, I personally feel that every now and then telling your child that no matter what happens and what you do, mm -hmm. parents always love you and they will always be there for you mm -hmm. um, to guide you and have fun with you. Is mm -hmm. that too much of a blanket statement? And can that- No, that's a wonderful statement, uh, Vinita. That's very good. Because that doesn't mean that it's, it's only two dimensional. You know, of course, there'll be times we'll have something that we want to advise them or we have conflict with. But the blanket statement is really our orientation. You know, we are there for you. We love you. We want to help you. We want to help you make a better life for yourself, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. No, I think that's a wonderful statement. I have another question here from Anita. She wants to know, how do you tell your children about experiences you have learned from without being too judgmental? Mm. Oh, I have to think about this. I was thinking about extrapolating this to also include how do you essentially uh, talk to your kids about serious <laughs> things like money, health, or controversial things, which I, I guess a lot of Indian parents consider sex education, you know? How do but you I talk mean, to your kids about these hard things? Basically, yeah. that's what we're coming to. Oh, how do we talk about these hard things? No, Without being I, preachy? no, well, it, one, it should never be preachy because once you start preaching, you know what's the automatic thing that's going to happen is rebellion. You're going to strike like the control issue. Nobody likes to be controlled. Even if you're five years old, you don't want to be controlled. So forget about when you're 15 years old, forget about when you're 25 years old. None of us, the human spirit is, we don't want to be controlled. We want to be listened to. We want to have our opinion understood. That doesn't mean we are going to agree with it. So it requires, of course, tact, that inner space to reflect, to be patient. We could always, you know, put a drop of advice here, come back, put another drop of advice a week later, wait and see that time is on our side. Not that we don't have to rush into anything, right? So the child may feel very, it's very urgent, but it's on our side. You know, time is on our side. That's, that's, so, that's an interesting point. Yeah. It, it reminds me of the Madonna song, Papa Don't Preach. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, you know, okay, we have another question from our chat audience. This is Vita Daryanani. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. How do you communicate with a child who is an introvert, who keeps everything to themselves? All right. So, all right. This is very, very important. Very important. So when a child has already developed a protective shell, he's developed this fortress and inside it's hidden. He's quiet, has kept everything inside, and now you can reach him. Why has that happened? Parents have to reflect. It's, like I said, development is an interpersonal, biological, interpersonal happening with mind and emotions on both sides. And this mapping in the brain happens in this interactive parent-child model. So it's not that he's become that way. <clears throat> there are dynamics that have led up to that. So if you go to the counselor, if the, and if the couple I think needs to go to the counselor to understand the dynamics of what may have led to this issue. Once they get a handle of it and look at themselves empathically, not with defensiveness, not with shame, but true honesty and empathy and, and desire to understand. Because dogma is a toxic thing. It leads to an impasse. If you're, if you're dogmatic, it leads to an impasse. So when the parents can learn from the therapist, oh, you know, now we can understand the path of development of why now this kid is living in this fortress and you can reach him. He, he's developed this fortress for a reason. And it's, you, you shouldn't feel bad because none of it was done intentionally. You shouldn't be judgmental about the kid. You shouldn't be ashamed about the kid. You have to be kind and empathic and do different types of pleasure things to show that you can also play. You're not right. always judgmental, you know. You can show your silly side. You can talk about your childhood craziness and show how human you are and things like that, you know. Perfect. Yeah. I know we are little running a little way over our allotted time, but we have such interesting questions coming in and Saida is such a hypnotic speaker. We have to have you for a little while longer, Saida. So I hope that's okay. And I hope- Absolutely. Just keep coming with their lovely questions. Yes. I have a question here from Gita. So Gita wants to know, how do you convince your adult children that their priorities in life have to change as you age? Okay, first we have to wonder about the question, convince, okay? I would have to say, oh, convince, huh? What, what do we mean by that, convince? So then the parent is taking the full responsibility that it is their responsibility to effect something, okay? But no, there's another mind and another a uh, set of feelings and plans and uh, ambitions and complexity and all of that. So the way to deal with your child is to know them, to talk to them, to first listen, not tell them. Because if you start telling them or try to convince them, the wall is going to go up and they may say, okay, okay, mama, okay, fine. Mm. And they are going to go about doing their business, which we don't want that to happen. We don't want the break in communications, right? We don't right. want breaks in communication. We want right. them to feel the safety of the relation, the safety that they can talk to us. So, so the first thing is to listen to the child. They may have their point of view. And remember, do the talking drop by drop. You know, nothing in a full dose, nothing with emotionality, raise questions. So then they expand their mind give your own thought, you know, I was thinking about this and this because for such and such a reason, you know, but I, I think I'm worried about this, you know. So let's say, could it be what? An issue, let's say about that they're spending so much money, right? Mm -hmm. For example, the kid is spending a lot of money. Now whose money is it? If it's the parent's money, then the parent shouldn't be giving them the full freedom to do that. Now he's got, the thing is a lot of these kids have a lot of plenty of money of their own. Okay, so they are going to spend the money and maybe get a Ferrari. And you're so mortally scared, like, oh my God, this kid has gotten a Ferrari. He's got a big loan on that car. It's, it's dangerous and whatnot. Now, 
now comes a very complex situation, right? We are not going to be able to convince him because it's going to be very hard. Right. So he said, you know, what made you decide that you wanted a Ferrari? You know, dad and I are kind of worried about it. You know, I can understand the desire of something wonderful and fancy like that. And there's a whole life ahead, blah, blah, blah. There's a whole life ahead. But right now, maybe, you know, you're still young. There's so much emotion and desire and passion in you. You know, when you're out with friends, our brain may not work as effectively. You're worried about your life. So when you come from the point of empathy, when you come from the point of understanding, then we can soften the field. The goal is to soften the field of tension. You know, then we'll be able to drop by drop, you know, see that how to bring them and align the situation so they can make more sensible decisions themselves. Because the goal in life is that we're not going to be there forever. We don't want to be the parent forever. Right. There's a path. And that path leads to, like you said, friendship. You know, we want to be friends. Even though we'll remain parents, we want to be more friends than parents as time goes. True. Yeah. True. So I guess empathy <coughs> is the key. Like all good things in life, empathy is the key. Just empathy is that. the key. Self-reflection is the key. Self-reflection. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I have a comment from Nirali that I would like to read out because we don't have any more questions. And okay. Nirali, it's a, it's a lovely comment which says... <laughs> True, it's important for us as parents to first learn our own prejudices and limitations before we have real conversation with our kids. We, and therefore use pause and respond rather than react to unexpected queries thrown our way. And no mm -hmm. matter what, all mm -hmm. our conversations always end with, I love you. I think that's a lovely, lovely very nice, lovely very nice statement. statement. Very nice statement. Very I think that would be, that, that's a perfect note for us to go ahead and conclude our session. And we've had such wonderful questions <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate everybody who submitted their questions. Thank you so much um, for asking these queries and Saida, you've been fantastic. Thank I you wish you were my mom, you really, can. with all yeah. that fun energy that you bring in. Um, and I hope a lot of these guys uh, who have joined us today um, have had some important take-home messages. And hopefully you guys will be able to go ahead and find it's really easy to practice um, some of these important principles that Saida just laid out for them. One more thing I want to say to the audience. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for attending. The take-home message is really, um, there's always hope. And there's always possibility of change. Always, always possibility for change. Even if it's bad, things can get better. But there's a, there's a way for it to get better and, and there's a way that it can get worse. And that's the message. So we all have the ability to work on things to make it better. So good luck to everybody and uh, best wishes. Thank you so much, Saida. On that optimistic note, I would like to say goodbye and thank you to everyone who joined in. This recording will be available on Facebook as well. So if you have Facebook accounts, you can always go back and check out our session. If you have any more questions, feel free to go ahead and email them to us at MICA or reach out to Dr. Koita directly and she'll be more than happy to get in touch with you and help you out. Yes, that we have as a MICA, um, as an organization, been very lucky to have the support of all our audience members. So thank you very much. And now as we transition to the live events, I hope you guys are able to go ahead and join us in this new world where things are coming back again um, to where we interact with each other. We have a lot more exciting shows and interesting events lined up for the rest of the year. Stay tuned follow us on social media or log on to our website mica.org to know more about these events thank you stay safe and have fun goodbye bye